Good afternoon. I'm Dan Sheely, the Executive Director of the University of Pennsylvania's Program for Research on Religion and Urban Civil Society, PROX, as well as the Director of the Collegium Institute. On behalf of PROX, Collegium, and Penn's Fox Leadership International Program, FLI, I welcome you to our special event with Professor Philip Jenkins. Today's lecture kicks off a four-part spring series on global religion, a new joint programming initiative of PROX and FLI. It will address sequentially the prospects for religion after the pandemic, the global state of religious freedom, the role of transnational religious organizations in addressing public health crises, and the past, present, and future of state-supported faith-based initiatives in America. Please stay tuned for a preview of the next event in the series at the conclusion of our program today. Today's lecture also launches a new phase for PROX. Founded in the year 2000 with a Pew Charitable Trust Center of Excellence grant, the Program for Research on Religion and Urban Civil Society last year just celebrated its 20th anniversary without much fanfare, of course. Uh, but even under quarantine, three generous and visionary Penn alumni stepped up to establish the PHL Fund that will extend and expand the work of PROX through the next decade. These alumni are James N. Perry, Francis Hager, and Vincenzo LaRufa, and we'd like to express our gratitude to them for enabling the wide variety of projects that will benefit Penn and the broader community through 2030. These initiatives include the Perry Collegium Initiative, Common Ground for Common Good, Sacred Places Civic Purposes, the Partnership for Empirical Studies and Surveys on Religion, and of course, the Project on Global Religion and Transnational Religious Organizations, of which today's event is an important debut. We'd also like to thank the many co-sponsors that contributed to making today's event a success. These are Penn's Department of Religious Studies, the Center on Religion and Culture at Fordham University, the American Catholic Historical Association, the Lumen Christi Institute, the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard University, the Genealogies of Modernity Project, Boston University Center for Global Christianity and Mission, Baylor Institutes for Studies of Religion, and Harvard Divinity School's Center for the Study of World Religions. Today's format will be relatively simple. After I introduce our speaker, he will speak for roughly 30 minutes, followed by roughly 30 minutes of Q&A. There's no need to wait until Q&A starts, however, in order to submit your question. Just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type your question as soon as you're ready. I will field the questions for Professor Jenkins and we'll do our best to address as many as possible, which might be an entertaining challenge given the size of our digital audience here. As for our speaker, Philip Jenkins is Distinguished Professor of History at Baylor University's Institute for Studies of Religion. Jenkins is also co-director of Baylor's program on historical studies of religion and Edwin Earl Sparks Professor of Humanities Emeritus at Pennsylvania State University. Among his more than 25 books, which have been translated into 16 languages, the following titles are included. The Next Christendom, The Rise of Global Christianity, The New Anti-Catholicism, God's Continent, Christianity, Islam, and Europe's Religious Crisis, Laying Down the Sword, Why We Can't Ignore the Bible's Violent Verses, and most recently, Fertility and Faith, The Demographic Revolution, <clears throat> Transformation of World Religions, which was just published last July. When I first encountered the work of Professor Jenkins in the early 2000s, I found him to be the most refreshingly optimistic voice in the academy regarding the global prospects of religion in what had been newly anointed as a secular age. 
He was, quote, believing in the global south, unquote, as my words, a, a, a potential savior for religion in the north. But has there been enough of a tectonic shift in the last 20 years, along with the chaos of just the past year, to reverse his determination? We'll soon find out. As I pass the screen on to Professor Jenkins for his words on religion after the pandemic, forecasting the global future of faith. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very pleased, uh, very honored to be uh, leading off this, uh, uh, this great series. Um, Daniel asks um, an excellent question about uh, optimism and uh, pessimism. And I suppose I would uh, say very simply that uh, religion is uh, always rising and always falling. And the question is where? Um, and uh, uh, in what way. I'm going to suggest this. Over the past 20 years especially, religion, or rather organized and institutional religion, very important distinction, has uh, suffered a very widespread decline in large sections of the world. I'm going to suggest that the pandemic itself uh, is accelerating that decline, will accelerate it, and we will see a major shift to the secular. But please also hear me, in some parts of the world, in other parts of the world, we do not see such a change. And so the suggestion is they would be at least, to coin a phrase, taking up the slack and possibly even as acting, uh, even acting as major new centers of vigorous growth. So. Uh, my answer to his question would be a very definite yes and no. Let me talk about the decline first. I'm going to be talking in the context of demography. Now, bear with me. That is absolutely not the only uh, way of looking at this, but it's an important one. Here's an observation. You can tell a lot about a society by its fertility rate. That is the uh, number of children that a woman will have during the course of her lifetime. If that number is uh, very small, uh, if it's uh, <clears throat> um, what we call below replacement rate, then you'll get an aging society, a contracting society. A very high fertility rate means uh, a young, expanding, turbulent society. So there are good pluses and minuses for both. But here's my point. There is a strong, very strong correlation between the fertility rate of a society and its degree of religious involvement and activism and the strength of organized and institutional religion. I don't have a huge amount of time to go uh, into why that should be, but let me just note the correlation is very strong that we can disagree about the causation. Over the last 50 or 60 years, Europe has been the storm center of that change fertility rates started shifting very rapidly, declining very rapidly, and that mapped almost exactly a shift to secularization, a steep decline in organized and institutional religion, decline in the churches. And we see that in lots of ways. We see it in uh, the form of religious attendance and participation. We see it in the number of uh, people prepared to go into the clergy, the number of women prepared to go into uh, convents, for example, um, and also a significant shift to the secular in policy making in terms of societies adopting policies in the teeth of ferocious opposition from religious organizations. Um, in Catholic Europe, for example, the shift towards abortion, divorce, um, same-sex marriage, uh, euthanasia. I'm not here to talk about the, uh, the nature of those debates, except to say that as society has secularized, so those uh, themes have become much more mainstream. Uh, Ireland, for example, just massively liberalized its laws on um, abortion, as did, well, as did Argentina. And that brings me to the next point. What we used to think of as a European revolution has now become global. Those European patterns of very low fertility and very low faith have in the last 20 to 30 years expanded to large sections of the globe. 
if you want to see some of the steepest falls in fertility and rises in secularization, you do not go to Denmark, you go to Latin America, you go to countries like Brazil, you go to East Asia. Now for many of us, uh, we may think back to the 1960s and 70s when people used to be very concerned about something called the population explosion, the population bomb. And we knew about the uh, incredible fertility rates in countries like India and Brazil and Mexico, and all that was true at the time. But the declines have been enormous, so that um, most of those countries now have fertility rates that are extremely low, extremely uh, European. If I look at India, for example, uh, half the states of India now have fertility rates that are below replacement. Some of the lowest fertility rates in the world are in East Asia. Well, come back to religion. That has correlated with a steep decline of religion in those relevant areas. And that's manifested in a number of ways. And one of them is the sharp growth of people who believe, uh, who, when you ask them, what is your religious affiliation, will say, none. I have none. And these people are called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Korea, for example, used to be very much a Buddhist nation. Then it had very rapidly going, uh, growing Christianity. When we next have the religious census in uh, Korea, South Korea, it is virtually certain that the strongest group will be the nuns. And Buddhism has gone into a steep and probably irreversible decline. For those of us who are looking at Korean Christianity, it is not declining, but it is not growing anything like as much as we believed. If you go to Brazil or Chile, where religion was a matter of Catholics and Protestants, now it's Catholics and Protestants and nuns. So this religious change and fertility change became a global phenomenon. And may I emphasize, not just in Christianity, not just in Buddhism, but in Islam. Many of us have this vision of uh, Islam with these very high fertility rates, very fervent religion. Let me describe one country to you, a country where in the 1980s, a typical woman could expect to have six or seven children in her life. And presently that number is down to 1.5, it's below Denmark. What country am I referring to? Iran. Well, we don't think of Iran as a secular country. The government is fervently religious, Recent surveys suggest that the people are as secular as anywhere you will find. Iran has 60,000 mosques, perhaps 3,000 of them are used with any uh, regularity. Point I'm making is that just in the last uh, 20 to 30 years, the secular drift has happened over much of the world, not all. And the countries, the areas that still have old style patterns, of fertility and faith are in parts of the Middle East, but above all the continent of Africa, which uh, retains very high fertility rates and remains astonishingly religious. So we have two phenomena going side by side. On the one hand, we have the contraction of religion in many parts of the world, but the maintenance and growing and thriving of religion above all in Africa. And as the phrase goes, what uh, happens in Africa does not stay in Africa. As people in various parts of the world um, age, as those societies contract in demographic terms, they need migrants. They need people to do the work and pay the taxes. And increasingly those migrants are going to be African. So the religious patterns that you see in um, Africa today, whether they are Muslim or Christian, will increasingly become the religious patterns of the religious practice in Europe and in the United States. Um, so, as I said, religion is rising and falling. And um, as you may be aware, if you look at any religious denomination, basically any Christian denomination, uh, 
so much of the growth in recent years has been in um, in Africa. The uh, Catholic growth um, has been has been astonishing. Um, it uh, so strong have Catholic numbers become in Africa. So strong uh, is the number of uh, vocations uh, that it's sometimes said that the greatest problem facing the Roman Catholic Church, and that's a sentence you can finish in many different ways, the greatest problem facing the Roman Catholic Church is that the Vatican is 2,000 miles too far north. That it, if it wants to be in the center of the Catholic world, it would need to be in Africa. What about the United States? If I was giving this lecture 20 years ago, I would have remarked that the United States was so different from Europe. It still was a very high fertility, high faith society. How can this possibly be? I don't know, let's try and explain it. That has changed dramatically since 2008 with the great crash of that year. And America has become a much more secular society. All the surveys will support this. Um, over the last uh, decade or so, uh, the proportion of uh, Americans who declare themselves to be Christian has fallen quite substantially from 77% to 65%. Uh, That's a, a great drop. We also see this great growth in the nuns. That is the people who you ask them, what is your religious affiliation? They say none. This category has been recognized for some years, but the really enormous growth goes from basically 2005 and especially 2008 on, and the 2010s were a period of dramatic growth. Presently in the United States, the three largest religious traditions are evangelical Christians, Roman Catholics, and nuns. I am positive that during the 2020s, the number of nuns is going to grow very substantially and I would project that the number of people who are prepared to say, I am an evangelical, is going to decline. Now, a reasonable objection here might be to say, this is not necessarily a change in how they believe or how they act, but how they identify. That's a fair comment. But America has become a much more secular country in its religious uh, statistics. And that was already happening before the 2020, whatever you want to call it, meltdown. I talked about this year 2008. It is so important because there was a great economic shock there that had an impact across the board and especially on immigrant groups and newer ethnic groups, especially Latinos, who previously had been regarded as extremely high faith. The growth of secular attitudes of nuns among Latinos very strongly dates to 2008. Why is that? It's partly an economic explanation. People no longer had the ability to uh, form families, uh, form households. Um, once people form families and households, they're much more likely to get involved in organized religion. They, they could not do that. There might have been a loss of uh, confidence. But to if you like to pull this together, already in the 2010s, we were having these serious secularizing trends. Come back to that question of definition. I am talking about trouble for organized and institutional religions of most kinds, not all, some did well. I am not necessarily talking about a corresponding decline in actual belief. Let me explain the difference. If I go to Europe at the moment, then the churches or churches are in deep trouble in terms of getting people into the institutions, of getting people to become clergy. This is a very, very difficult time. And yet we live in what is probably the golden age of European pilgrimage. In other words, People are very prepared to express religious views, to say that, yes, I believe in God. Yes, I believe in the Bible. Yes, I believe in the Virgin Mary. People will go to really very medieval uh, shrines uh, of saints and the Virgin and seek out healing. This is not an atheist society, but it is secularizing 
in the sense of moving away from institutions. And my suggestion is that that is the direction that the United States is moving in. And when I'm very pessimistic, I would draw uh, an analogy there, which is, all right, let, let me put on my, 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 my black hat of a villain and say this, if you look at uh, the Canadian province of Quebec, which in 1960 was by far the most religious and Catholic and enthusiastic uh, part of the Americas, and in the space of about 10 years, suffered a quiet revolution, which left it one of the most secular parts of the Americas. Is that a portrait of the United States? I don't know, but when sometimes in the dark of night, I do think that. What about the pandemic? My suggestion is that certain trends were in progress before 2020, and they were going to move along at a certain rate. In this, as in so much else, I believe the pandemic had what we might call a rocket sled effect. It took trends that were already in progress and were going to take 10 years and squeezed them into one year. Now, if you look, for instance, at uh, the retail business, you see this. You see many stores and uh, businesses that were in some trouble in the 2010s, and then suddenly everything hit so hard in, the, in 2020 that they went out of business. I think we see a little bit of that in the context of religion, an acceleration, not a sudden overnight change. What is this? Uh, what is this change? Well, several things. Firstly, uh, many churches, many religious institutions have had terrible economic problems as a result of the um, uh, 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 of the virus crisis. Fairly obviously, and we might say, well, you know, churches have had economic difficulties uh, before. They will dig out of this. Perhaps they will. But the analogy then, again, I would draw is the 1930s. America lost so many of its rural churches then, not because of loss of faith, but because congregations could not get the economic mass to survive and keep going. That's a concern. I also think there are now and will be two key structural changes in American religion, and anyone writing on that religion has to take full account of them. One is a change in the role of clergy and what clergy can feasibly do. What do clergy do? They are involved in face-to-face -face interactions in so many aspects of baptisms, of marriages, of funerals. As I remarked um, last year, and obviously wouldn't be true this year, it was tragic to see many, uh, so many uh, Jews unable to have their uh, seder with full family gathering. Well, family ties will survive. But um, already it becomes harder to maintain that religious identity, congregational identity, clerical role, where clergy cannot fulfill those functions. People learn to cope without those clergy. And this is the key point. They become detached from the institution. If I watch my computer screen and I can watch a service from my local church or I can watch it from a grand cathedral somewhere or I can use my cafeteria choice and do one church this week, one church this week, I become so detached from the tie to that congregation that has kept me within that church. Church is something that you watch rather than do or, um, or, uh, or visit. There's another psychological change, I think, that was already very much in progress before 2020. But again, we hear that rocket sled pushing us from behind. Think what so much religious behavior has been in the last year. It has been a matter of watching screens, of figuring out uh, Zoom, and it's affected our language. Did you watch church today? Did you watch the service? Not were you there? 
And there are a series of things that for all of our experience have been so fundamental to humanity and human participation and are now changing almost overnight. A sense of place. Where are we? I see this church service on the screen. I see the altar. Where am I? Well, I'm actually in my chair and I need a exercise of mental ability to place myself there. Place, presence, participation, physicality. Is it possible to maintain the same kind of identity with a congregation, with a church, to participate in services remotely than uh, actually being present? What is that difference? What does it mean to be uh, uh, to be there face to face? And it is quite possible that uh, over time people will uh, will look back at 2020 and 2021 and they will say, oh yes, that was a very strange time, but uh, uh, you know we're now back to going to church, we go to synagogue regularly. Maybe, but I think that detachment is going to be very hard to get over and reverse. So I suggest we might be moving to a whole new set of religious attitudes that are going to detach us from traditional ideas of uh, clergy, what clergy are, of religious participation. And then you combine that with the other trends that I'm talking about in terms of um, the nuns, of people who reject religious affiliation, of the decline of denominations, um, of people moving away from those, uh, 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 those churches. And I think the US especially faces a period of quite uh, troubling change. And I, I would add various uh, uh, other things, for example, and again, we have the rocket sled effect, um, religious uh, seminaries, uh, many religious colleges were already in quite a delicate way before the pandemic. And then you get so many calls to move to remote teaching, you get so much undermining of the finances of those places. We are going to go through a revolution in uh, religious higher education in the next uh, in the next decade. So I see a great many changes. If churches and religious institutions exercise enough imagination and creativity, they can build on this new situation and deal with, well, what, what is uh, Christianity about if not learning to deal with new media? Christianity begins with a shift from the scroll to the codex. Christianity receives its great uh, uh, leap forward when Protestants and Catholics uh, print. Um, so why should this not be a media revolution which offers whole new kinds of spirituality that presently we can barely imagine? We don't have the vocabulary. So am I talking about religious decline in the United States? And the answer is, I don't know. I think we're talking about very rapid uh, change, potentially, a decline by many uh, statistics. And I can already hear the stories and read the stories uh, about how this is the, you know, the end of Christianity in the United States. Fine. Uh, as the phrase goes, the, uh, you know, the church is um, an anvil that has worn out many hammers. Uh, it, 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 uh, it has a habit of, uh, uh, of persisting. But if you're ever tempted to think that, that it is dying as opposed to moving to some new form, to something rich and strange, then I would encourage you to look on a global scale, which is why I was so pleased to see the global uh, format of these, uh, of these four lectures. And if you look at the larger scale, no, Christianity uh, is not uh, dying. It's entering a, a highly successful uh, period. 
uh, it is booming in many parts of the world, and there are whole sections of the world where Christianity is developing a powerful presence where it has never had one. And I mean, I, I, I just give you one example. Uh, we're all familiar, for example, with the idea of Muslim populations, Muslim migrants coming to Europe and setting up these uh, this sizable Muslim presence. Interesting, that's a product of immigration. It's Europe not having the people to do the jobs and pay the taxes. That's an exact mirror of what is happening in the, uh, the Arab Gulf and in Saudi Arabia, countries where for many, many centuries there were no Christians. And suddenly through immigration from India and the Philippines, we have very substantial Christian populations in a, a once solidly Muslim society. How many are there? Maybe 7% of the population, 10% of the population. We're, uh, we're not sure. But these are dramatic times. I mean, the one constant in the history of Christianity is change, perhaps in, uh, in religion, uh, religion generally. So what I would uh, suggest is there is a large story going on here, which I personally would relate to demography, and with that to factors like gender, uh, gender change, change in gender role, changing concepts of uh, family, changing concepts of the, uh, the, the individual, uh, the, 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 this whole great uh, change that leads to what is sometimes called the second demographic transition. Very important. But that the pandemic is accelerating those and what you have uh, in consequence is an era of crisis, which if treated and responded to correctly, can actually lead to a whole series of, uh, of opportunities in terms of uh, changes in the way that we, quote, do, uh, uh, do religion. And I would just add one thing there, which is, um, Americans especially, I think, need to think very hard about the language they use about uh, when, they say, uh, when they conceive of the Christian world or Christian America. The geography of that world is going to be so different from what they have always been used to. And one of the great centers of change and redefinition within that is going to be the United States which for so long has been the great center of so, so much Christian uh, activity. Am I sending a council of despair? Absolutely not. But I do know that when we write the history of religious change, if you like religious revolution in this century, an awful lot of chapters are going to begin and end in 2020. It's a frightening time to be living through a revolution, but I'm afraid that's, uh, uh, that's what we have. So before I return to uh, Daniel to begin uh, uh, to hand over to questions, uh, I, I would just say that I hope I have not um, alarmed him too much and that I have given um, a little bit of uh, comfort in my remarks. So Daniel, over to you. <laughs> 